This book talk is part of the online resource series for K-12 teachers offered by the National Consortium for Teaching About Asia at the University of Colorado Boulder. I'm John Zeljo, staff member at NCTA University of Colorado, and I'll be talking with Jeffrey Wasserstrom, professor of history at University of California, Irvine, and a specialist in Chinese history. Jeff's work on China has run the gamut from scholarly research and publications to analysis and commentary designed for general audiences. He has written for Time, Newsweek, and a variety of newspapers, and is a regular interviewee on TV and radio, including PBS and NPR. One of his most recent books, China in the 21st Century, What Everyone Needs to Know, first published in 2010, is now in its second edition. We asked Jeff to talk about this book as a teaching resource for secondary teachers. The book was intended for general audiences. Could you talk a little bit about what your goal was for writing such a book and what can teachers expect from the book? Well, my goal was to try to get across very concisely a lot of information about China today, but to explain why knowing about China's past was crucial to understand what was going on in China today. So the idea was a book short enough that if somebody were traveling to China, they could read the whole book on the flight and still catch a movie or two. And so it has that very, very direct um, readability to it. And it's in the form of questions and answers. So it was the answers to commonly asked questions about China, including the ones that I was getting asked after I would give public talks about China to either anything from high school classes where I've sometimes spoken to elder hostel or to kind of general lifelong learner types. Mm -hmm. Why a second edition already? The first edition just came out in 2010. Isn't that a little soon for something like this? Well, I think if a country was changing less quickly than China is, um, this would be too soon. But it was quite striking when we, would, when we looked at what questions were in the book and what questions weren't in the book how many things had just happened since 2010, or really since 2009 when they had put the book uh, to bed. Uh, Liu Xiaobo had won the Nobel Peace Prize. China had a second Nobel Literary Prize won in Mo Yan, and neither Liu Xiaobo nor Mo Yan were really discussed, were discussed in the first edition. Even though they were active, they hadn't been as centrally mm -hmm. significant. Ai Weiwei, who was already an important artist, hadn't become as globally famous as an artist. So just there, and just in terms of the kind of famous people that needed to be worked in. And, you know, there was a leadership transition um, coming up. And so that seemed a good time to, to update the book. What are some key things that you knew from the start definitely needed to be changed about the first edition or added to the new one? Well, the first edition had come out in the wake of the Beijing Olympics. And the, that had been one of the events that really, I think, dramatically transformed China's image in the world. And so that, there's a lot of attention still to the Beijing Olympics in, in the new edition. But because of that mega event being so significant as a global as well as a Chinese event, there was a lot in the first edition about the World Expo, the 2010 World Expo held in Shanghai, which was a big, big deal in China and arguably should have been a big deal globally. It was the largest event held in the history of the world in terms of the number of people who came to it, um, you know, over 70 million, breaking the previous record for the most visited World's Fair. So, I mean, it was important for China because the previous record was held by Japan. So, you know, besting the uh, Japanese record was important, but it never really captured the global imagination the way that the Beijing Games had. So I knew there'd need to be some scaling back of the discussion mm -hmm. of the expo. But on the other hand, China's economic surge had continued. And there had been a shift, I think, in, in global thinking about China's, China's reach around the world. So there needed to be more attention to the way in which China was impacting the rest of the world. I knew there'd need to be more attention to pollution, which had become something that had become an increasing concern within China and increasing mm -hmm. concern internationally. So those things, and I knew the Boshi Lai scandal had happened, that needed to be brought in. Although already I'm thinking, you know, the second edition doesn't talk about his sentencing, and this was in the news. So, you know, that's something that, if I'm lucky enough to do a third edition, I, I already know at least some things that'll be in it. Anything you're glad you didn't have to alter 
or that could just stay as it was from the first edition? Well, I was really glad I could keep the same cover, that they let us keep the same cover, changing just the color of uh, cover, keeping the same images, this juxtaposition of images of Chinese youth outside of a punk rock concert and Chinese government officials looking very staid. And, you know, I liked, I've, I've loved talking about that cover and the way in which it captures the kind of conundrum of coming to terms with contemporary China. We've, we've never had the experience of a buttoned down authoritarian state that could allow a punk rock concert. And at the same time, you could say conversely, we haven't had the kind of setting where there's sort of like a, a youth culture that's in step with the rest of the world. And yet, certain things about the political system have stayed so rigid. So that was something that I was really glad they let me, they let me keep. So anything you're sorry you didn't have to change when prepping the new edition? Well, I would have loved to be able to change the answer I have to the question of wh how the Chinese government uh, tells the story of what happened in 1989 and the fact that the Chinese government prevents open discussion of the June 4th massacre and um, cast this sort of big lie that all there was was this effort to create turmoil and then order was restored. I would love to have been able to say, and you know, I would like to be able to do a new edition that at some point in the future that would say the Chinese government finally started to come to terms with um, the brutality with which they crushed that movement. But I haven't been able to do that. And I haven't been able to, wasn't able to change things about repression in Tibet. Uh, another issue that you know, I would really look forward to changing. Mm -hmm. What's been the reception to the book? Anything surprising or unexpected? Well, I, the, the best news about the second edition is there is a Chinese edition has come out, uh, only available in Taiwan and Hong Kong, I assume, in complex characters, not in simplified characters. Um, they would just have to cut too many, too many things talk about hot button issues for it to come out on the mainland. But I'm really delighted um, that, an, issue, that a, an edition's out in Taiwan. and even more surprising that there are some um, bookstores that have held book discussions without the author but with maybe a translator or just somebody coming in to to talk about what's going on in the mainland uh, using this book as a, as a prompt. Mm. There's an Indonesian translation in the works uh, and the, er, these will join the earlier ones which um, included a Turkish translation and a Korean translation and I haven't quite figured out how you yeah, these are all places where there's some concern about China, and in some cases where there aren't that many China books being written in the language in question, like mm -hmm. Turkey. And it apparently sold fairly well in Turkey, so who knew? Uh, I, w I was a little surprised, maybe not too surprised, but how m I was surprised at how much of the commentary about the book on the Amazon site and things like that fixate on um, on one one claim in the book, which is, which is trying to explain how Mao is understood as something much more complex than um, simply a monster within China and trying to untangle. I, I talk about, and this is a controversial thing, I talk about how it's not that hard to think about people being able to say at one and the same time, associate a political leader with some horrible things that were done and yet still have him his image in kind of revered spaces, like on a banknote. Mm -hmm. And I use the example of Andrew, jo uh, Andrew Jackson being on the $20 bill, even though many Americans now would find repulsive what he said about Native American, what he did to Native Americans and what he said about African Americans. And yet people would say, yeah, but he founded a political party that we admire or we think had some good things going for it and he was more of a man of the people than some later politicians. And I say that some people in China, not all, but some would say the same thing about, mm. about Mao. Mm. So I think that, I knew that would be controversial, but I was a little bit surprised at how much of the attention on things like the Amazon site mm. go to talking about what an apologist I am mm. from that. So how, how kind of divisive any kind of discussion of, of Mao has become in the West. And the legacy of Mao is an important um, concept that teachers grapple with in their classes. And with those who commented on, on that aspect of your book, um, 
what 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 do you think their background has been? Are they Americans? Or are they? Um... Yeah, actually, it was it was Americans, or or some cases, I think. Um, I mean, one of the things that that's come out of it is there's one line on, on on Mao that sometimes comes out of an analogy to Hitler, which then doesn't allow any kind of, 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 of wiggle room for this. Or, and, and coming out of that sometimes will be parallels of the Cultural Revolution to the Holocaust, or you know, it's something that Chinese come to terms with in that way. And what's just so much more complicated about that, the Cultural Revolution Holocaust idea, what's so just different, it's not about you know, moral judgments, but what's different is that during the Cultural Revolution, you could start out a victim and become a victimizer, or you know, you could be classified at one point as a group to be struggled against and another not. And you know, you just don't have that shifting of um, subject positions in in the Holocaust. And Mao, you know, he lived a you know, he lived a long time, and I think there is a you know, there's a debate the debate among scholars about Mao isn't about whether he did horrible things late in his life, and it isn't about whether the, you know, the Great Leap um, Forward famine was just a horrific, horrific thing, and I don't deny that, and nobody I know denies that or even wants to downplay it. The debate among scholars is, do you treat Mao as having been sort of evil from the very beginning, or do you see a kind of trajectory in which power corrupts and the dictator becomes more and more out of step with the real world and does more and more horrific things. And so I think, you know, in teaching, that would be one of the things. And for me is, are there still things you can read that Mao wrote or that Mao was associated with that you can see something positive about? And I think, you know, the new marriage law in 1950 that gave Chinese women more rights than they'd ever had before is something I'm just not comfortable writing out of the history, you know, which if Mao becomes Hitler, it becomes a dismissal of things like that. And for the benefit of our teachers watching this and the students they teach, what do you see as a major takeaway from the book? Well, I think one of the most interesting takeaways is that the big question about China from the time that I've cared about China, which started in the late 1970s to the present, there's been a really dramatic shift. In the late 1970s, the question was, would China be able to modernize? Would China ever be a strong country? Would it, because it had come out of the turmoil and upheaval of the Cultural Revolution. It was still largely rural. It was still with not much of a kind of really strong transportation infrastructure. So there was a lot of discussion of the four modernizations. This was what Deng Xiaoping was going to do. And hard as this is to imagine, there were Americans rooting for China to modernize as quickly as possible because we imagined that if it modernized, it would democratize. And so the Chinese leaders wanted China to modernize. We wanted China to modernize. And even Chinese dissidents wanted, um, w wanted China to modernize and develop. They loved their country. But they said China would have to democratize in order to modernize. And now we're dealing with this odd period where China has modernized, it didn't have to democratize first, like some of the dissidents thought. Mm -hmm. It didn't democratize automatically afterwards, like a lot of Americans hoped. And yet, so now the question about China isn't, will it be able to become a strong modern country? It's more, what have the, what's the impact of that modernization been for the Chinese people and for the world? And increasingly, a takeaway is that a lot of the kind of ferment in China now is about people being disquieted or pushing back against a form of modernization being shoved down their throat, or them wondering if the cost in terms of the quality of their daily life was worth it. And so I think that that's a big takeaway. And the other big takeaway is just that China is much more diverse than a lot of Americans imagine. I try to hammer home the variation based on locale, on um, generation, that makes it impossible to ever say, what do the Chinese think about this or that? And so I think, I think those, and that no matter how much we think of China now being at the sort of cutting edge of, his, of, of development and being at the cutting edge of the world, his history still inflects what's going on there in many different ways. Do you have any suggestions for how our, te our, our teachers may be able to use the book in their classes with their students? 
Well, I think maybe the one of the most teachable parts of of the book would be the section on that tries to argue or tries to suggest that instead of thinking of China and America as opposite countries and totally unlike, that we think about the parallels between China and the United States today. I mean, we're the two countries that are most likely to veto an action in the UN Security Council. We're most likely to be seen as going our own way in an international um, setting. And a lot of the world thinks of it as in a kind of similar categories, these really big, powerful countries that like to call the shots in the world. Mm -hmm. But I also say there are a lot of parallels between China now and the United States about 100 years ago, when we were the rapidly developing country that was making the established powers kind of uncomfortable and wondering what we were up to. So I think that part, because you know the students will be familiar with at least parts of the American story, they'll live through, they're living in America now, if this is taught in the US, and they'll know something about the United States 100 years ago. So I think that might give some, you know, some teachability there. Um, and I think also the, the, the part about the future, I think thinking about when I describe the, the challenges that the government faces in China and the things that are on ordinary Chinese people's minds, I think asking how similar those are to the things that are on their minds would be another part. So, you know, earlier parts of the book I think are more providing you with the foundation from which you can understand enough about China to think about its present. But probably the, the most interesting discussion in a classroom will be the part about the present, not about the past. So you've alluded um, to a third edition. Any plans for that third edition? And if so, anything you already know you'll need to work in there? You mentioned the Oshi Lai trial. Any, anything else? Well, I think, I think that, I think the, the theme that started to emerge in the second edition as, as increasingly important, I think, will be even more so, which is the, the sort of crucial nature of daily life concerns in shaping politics. I think we've continued to see that. Um, there's that, that I think from the outside, a lot of times the question is that whether China, when will China have a kind of organized movement that will seek systemic change? And the people we often focus on are you know, people who are, are formally trying to say the government structures have to change. But I think what we're seeing, and I think this will be even more as we go forward, is more of a fraying of the kind of deal that the government made after 89, which was like, allow us to keep governing and we'll keep improving the quality of life. I think more and more people are starting to wonder what it means to be saying, you know, is our life getting better? The big question in America um, that Reagan posed is you, you need, any government needs to ask, are you better off than you were a few years ago? And in China, for a long stretch there, people were very ready to answer yes. We, a lot of us are just living better. But now I think with things like the cascading food safety scandals, um, the pollution scandals, and most recently some of the events that made headlines over the summer were things like um, street vendors getting beaten up by these paramilitary, um, or these para, paralegal enforcers of urban regulations that just, you know, a lot of, that, that got a lot of sympathy to people who were beaten up by them, you know, is, is suggesting that there's just this whole wellspring of anxiety about um, the disconnect between the government's priorities and ordinary people's concerns that I think we're going to start seeing popping up in more and more ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably what, if I'm lucky enough to do a third edition, we'll have to get even more attention. Well, we'll look forward to having you back then with the third edition. Thank you so much for your thoughts, your ideas, and your time today, Jeff. Oh, it's been a great pleasure. Thanks.